Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel. Thank you for all the comments and the subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. Today's episode, we are gonna look at IBM. Behind me is IBM's annual report for 2019. We're gonna comb through it, look at the financials, look at the cash flow, see how much they generate or don't generate, and get an understanding of what the business value might be. Look into the market, see what that current trading price is, and if there's a gap, see what kind of IRR we can get if we hold in the stock while that gap closes. Here at Rational Investing, we use cash flow as the underpinning and the reason for valuing any business, and we look at five key attributes for all securities that we invest in. The first being top line revenue growth must be there. Second, EBITDA. EBITDA is the enterprise level earnings. We need enterprise level earnings to be growing. Third, we need strong cash flow. Fourth, we need low debt. By debt, we define that as three times debt to EBITDA. And five, we need a well-priced stock. Well-priced being enterprise value divided by EBITDA. Those are our five criteria. We look at all securities with the same criteria and try to figure out uh, kind of on a, on a relative basis where we should be putting our funds. So without further ado, let's dive into uh, to IBM. Let's take a look and see what the financials look like. Uh, and where they where we think they might be going. It's uh, going to be an interesting ride. Revenue over the past nine years has gone from two thousand uh, gone from one hundred and six billion dollars to seventy seven billion dollars. Not a great legacy. That is an annual decline of four percent over that period of time. You can see why Virginia has been been retired uh, and there's a new president and chairman coming in. Um, I don't really understand the statement that she put out there on the very front page. Uh, I thought that was uh, a little um, a little rosy for the decade, given how much deterioration of value has happened uh, to kind of talk about the hundreds of thousands of over the last decade transform your business. Uh, transformed it to what? This is rough. $106 billion to $77 billion of deterioration. EBITDA, $26 billion to $16 billion billion dollars. That is a 4% decline. Debt, debt has gone from $27 billion, ballooned up to $66 billion. That's actually grown. Uh, cash outstanding is okay, or excuse me, excess cash. Market cap, $221 billion to $118 billion. That is roughly 50% cut in the, in the market cap of the business. Enterprise value getting, adding the debt, adding the market cap, less the excess cash goes from a quarter trillion dollars to $184 billion. Ouch. That is a far, far cry from where we would like to see old Big Blue. Um, and then the enterprise value EBITDA market multiple, four point, uh, excuse me, 9.4 to roughly 11. It's currently sitting at 10 and a half times enterprise value as it currently trades. Tall single digit, low double digit enterprise value for a business this size is, is very reasonable, if not cheap, uh, if they can turn the business around. I think that's, that's the story you're looking at here. Um, on the debt side, debt was one times, it's gone up to four times, which is above our criteria. It's gonna be a red flag for us. We need to see why they did that and what's going on. Let's finish out cash flow, and then we'll talk about the business. Uh, cash <clears throat> flow from operation $19 billion to $14 billion. It's a decline of 4%. That 4% smell checks with the decline in the EBITDA rate that we're seeing. So they are representing the deterioration accurately. I'm just sorry, it's deterioration. Um, now, I'm to pause here. This is where it started getting interesting. Yeah, I, I flew through that remarkably quickly, mainly because it's all deterioration. It's kind of a past. Uh, this is a turnaround story, and I want to get to the story. And I think the story begins here. Cash flow from operations obviously declining, which is which is which is fine. It it, it is what it is. Capex uh, declines with the operation. But what I liked here is the spread surprised me. The 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 spread between the 14 point, I call it $15 billion of cash flow from operations that they generated. They only put back $2.2 billion into the enterprise, which left about $12.5 $12. billion of free cash flow that could pass to the equity holders. The debt section here, 
This large $18 billion is not actually free cash that you can dividend. They bought Red Hat, they debt financed some of it. That $18 billion is for the cash to, to buy that business. So we're gonna have to scratch that out and not rely on this line. But you can look at the past couple years, in fact, the past many years, uh, the business produces a tremendous amount of cash despite the declining revenue and the de declining um, EBITDA. So in general, in this range, you're looking at 17 to $15 billion of uh, cash flow from operations, call it 3 billion, a little more than 3 billion of CapEx, a little bit of debt, but some positive, some minuses that they, as they pay back and, and, and pay down debt. And in this range, you're at high of 16 billion, low of $10 billion of distributable free cash flow. And that is what we value businesses on. And that's that's underpinning the value here. Um, and when I put that on a so so we'll get to per share. Let's look at shares. <clears throat> oh, what they what they've been using that cash flow for is pay a dividend, which is very healthy, and they've been buying back a tremendous amount of stock. If you look on average, they buy back four percent of the outstanding shares over this period of time, which is amazing and a very big number. We don't see uh, and we've been doing this for a while. We don't see many, um, you know, solidly single-digit buybacks uh, over that period of time. So they went from uh, 1.17 billion shares to 886 million outstanding. Uh, that's amazing. Here's your free cash flow per share. Uh, here's the share price, <clears throat> and here's a yield. And what I want to show you. Right in this region, when we were talking 17 to $10 billion of free cash flow, look at these yields. That is a 10% free cash flow yield on a stock in a rate market right now, which is what, 20 basis points, 50 basis points for a 10 year bond? It's incredible. And here you had a company that had one times debt, uh, declining earnings, I get you, We'll get there, but yielding 10% is a very strong yield if they can stop the decline or better yet, turn around. But you don't see many double digits uh, free cash flow yields on this channel and the stocks that we look at when we have in the past, typically we've regretted not being able to buy it then. Uh, some of the last ones that we did uh, yielded double digits and you fast forward in time, the market uh, uh, kind of rebounded and that yield came down to a solid single digit number and, and it would have been nice had we known to buy it then. But I think that's what we're looking at here. Even the most recent year without the debt financing, you're looking at a 10%, roughly 10% yield, which is amazing. If I add this back, I think you're kind of right there. Uh, the stock price has moved up. It was 117-ish last fiscal in 18. 134 in that range of the fiscal 19. I think we're 120, 125 now. So stock has actually come down a little bit since then. Uh, very interesting if they can turn the business around. So let's recap, see where we are. Revenue growth, not there. EBITDA, not there. Uh, debt, no, four times. Well-priced, it is, it is low, it's been beaten down, it is cheap. I'll give it even the cheap handle. Um, and strong free cash flow, yes. <clears throat> so why do I like the stock? Uh, uh, the prospects, we'll get to the forecast in a second, but, but with so many negatives on our five key factors, what gives? Well, realistically, you value companies on free cash flow. Uh, and that is the single biggest driver of value that we need to go after. So if that one is strong, I'm still interested in the opportunity here. Uh, if this was also negative or declining, it would have been a long pass, but because it's so positive, uh, I'm still in the running, still interested to see what this stock can do. So we're gonna, we're gonna forecast, we're gonna talk about that and see what kind of return we could have if those pass pan out. But I really like the cash flow. That was a shining example of what, what free cash flow can do. Let's turn and go into the 10K. So this is revenue by sector. Uh, and you can see cloud and cognitive software, $23 billion, year over year growth, 6%. This is what they're betting on. When, when, you, when you listen to the earnings call and you listen to the new, CF, new uh, CFO and the new CEO talk, they're obviously betting heavily in the 
cloud solutions the very first slide they bought the red hat they're touting this 60 percent revenue growth model which is really nice i i think this 60 percent relates to the cloud business i'm guessing if someone knows this throw in the comment i thought this was unclear does this mean 60 percent over all revenue no that can't be this is 60 percent of uh the cloud service in fact just saying it out loud now makes more sense but uh this business is what they're relying for in the future uh, when you go back and you look at the rest of the business groups, uh, a lot of them are declining, particularly the uh, global technology solutions, which is $27 billion of revenue. A big chunky number for them is declining at 3.7% uh, rate of uh, annual decline. The rest of this here is kind of smaller dollar amount, so I'm less concerned here. I'm really looking at these top three and you've got six percent growth you've got two percent growth and you've got a minus 3.7 percent growth so it's going to take them a little time now uh in my personal life i do i'm a cfo i do turnaround work for companies that are looking to turn themselves around uh and i, I love it it's extremely engaging it's very difficult finance work and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun for me as a professional to go do um the biggest thing you need right, a couple things but but really you need you need cash you need time and you need a good management. Those three things, and you can turn around a business. Um, uh, so that's pretty much what I'm gonna look for here. What's the management look like? Uh, how much time do they need, or, or can they buy time with cash if they don't have it? When I looked at the LinkedIn bio of Arvind, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, forgive me if I'm not. Um, he came out of the cloud division in IBM, been there for a long, long time. Uh, seems to really understand that model. And if they're leaning into it, it's nice to see them start shedding other assets that are non-core and really taking the reins and leading the company. It's going to take someone to take risks and su shut down, sell, divest non-core assets to focus the business. Otherwise, he's never going to get there. So I think he's doing the right thing by most recently. He has said he's going to do some of that. Uh, and I think that's what's got to hap happen. You, you cannot approach a turnaround or restructure uh, calmly. He must kind of shake up the business to get all the employees to go in the one direction. And I, I give him uh, credit for doing that. Uh, second, it did sound like he came out of that cloud business, which I like is hopefully he has that experience to go pull it off. But you're basically betting on these two. So I would definitely, definitely listen to the conference calls and, and, uh, and hear from them. As far as the other things, time, Time is, is, is alone, you can't make it obviously, but you need cash to survive long enough. And it looks like when I look at their financial statements, the debt is higher than we would like at four times. But it's high because they bought the Red Hat, and I think that's gonna come down over time if they're able to grow. Uh, four times is not unheard of. You know, 10, 15 times would be absolutely risk of bankruptcy. Four X is not ideal, but it's not too far away from the three. So I'm gonna give that a pass. Um, the main thing I like is how much free cash flow they, uh, they produce. And I think that given to a, a professional like the new CEO and CFO for what they're willing to do, gives them a real shot in the arm to be able to get this done. So I, I think this is something you should take a look at and, and perhaps even start building a position in it if you're interested in it. Uh, let's let's forecast some growth and see what that looks like in an IRR. So what I'm going to do is when I look at the the growth rate recently, you kind of look heavy decline in here, and it starts stabilizing in the last couple years. You kind of decline from 18 and a half to 16, then from 16.2 it grows to 16.7, 16.7 to 16.8. So I I'm hoping that means they're starting to bottom out. Uh, and it's an interesting ref inflection point. So going forward, I took last year's EBITDA and I said we're gonna hold it flat as they continue to do what the kind of the turnaround that they're gonna have to do, COVID, whatnot. And then long term, I wanna see them march on with a 4% annualized growth rate, which is not at all out of line uh, and, and what they could do given the decline of the existing business and the growth in the software business which again is growing at 6% uh, per year, is, uh, is, is a good third of their revenue. Uh, so I think that over time they'll get there. They need to pull 4% out, 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 out of the hat, if you will, and it's a solid number. It's not too aggressive in my opinion, 
putting a long-term EBITDA target, which is consistent with what I've seen on some of the some of the street forecasts, at least long-term out there is 20 billion range. I got 23 here in uh, 2029. And then what I've done is I've put a 15 handle on it. Uh, I think if if they are able to actually accomplish the growth, right? Because the, 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 it's, it's in written off. That's why it's got 10.5 times EBITDA because it's declined for almost a decade. If they turn and grow it, you're going to see that market multiple expand pretty quickly because it is really big. It has a subscription piece. It is a globally diversified behemoth, which is a very good blue chip. Uh, it just has had, it struggled in the past. So if they turn it around, the market multiple will expand. 15 times give me a $360 billion market cap, less debt, cash. I'm just using ratios historically to forecast what that looks like. Outstanding shares, only 600, uh, excuse me, 886 million shares because they bought so many down. It gives me a price target when I divide market cap by shares of $318 a share, which is a very robust share price given only a 4% growth rate in the EBITDA. Now, the same thing happens when I take their strong free cash flow that they already produce. I grow it at 4% um, and, and I, I, I attach a 4% free cash flow yield to it, right? Because they're yielding 10% right now. But if they, that's because revenue is declining. No one's willing to buy it. So it's a strong yield because they think cash flow is going to degrade. Well, if cash flow starts turning around and growing, people are going to rush the stock. Yield is going to come down. So I think consistent with some of the other software companies we have looked at, yields in a low single digit makes sense. Here I'm giving it a 4%, which gives it a $513 price target, which is very rich. But they have very strong cash flow. So... We have two market, uh, two valuation metrics, one on free cash flow, one on the EBITDA market multiple method. Let's average the two and see what we get. Stock is currently $125 a share, roughly. I've got two metrics. They vary quite substantially. 513, call it 500 with one value, 318 or another. And I think that, that divergence represents kind of the spectrum that we can see because uh, cash flow is so strong, but yet the investors do seem to be undervaluing it. And then you've got the EBITDA, they've turned around that market multiple is really gonna hinge on that valuation. If it gets 15, if it goes to 20, it's even higher. But we're gonna kind of split the difference, call it 416 for a long-term price target out 10 years if they can manage the turnaround. And if they can hit the 4% EBITDA growth, then that's what we get. If I put this into an IRR, I bought the stock at $1.20, $125. I get a stream of strong cash flows. You're not going to get all of this cash flow. It's not going to, uh, it's not going to happen. It's either going to be some will dividend out, some will be used to buy back shares, uh, and and some might be used to go out and make other large scale acquisitions. Uh, in which case, they should grow even faster. Remember, this cash flow already has a big amount of CapEx already into it, right? They're already putting 2.2 uh, in the prior years in the three, three and a half billion a year in the CapEx. So this money is already in the cash flow forecast. So they're already maintaining, all they're doing is be deploying that cash flow it from, from one division that they're shutting down into the cloud services. They'll have money to do what they need to do with the cloud. Um, so I think, I think that they can hit this number without too much excess cash. They could raise more debt. And as they grow their EBITDA, that debt multiple will come down and they'll be able to manage it a bit better. So I think this strong cash flow here really does underpin a strong uh, IRR calculation, which is what you're seeing. If, if I buy the stock at $125 a share, I get this stream of cash flow and I sell it for anywhere near $400 a share. That's a 26% annualized IRR. That's a very, very healthy IRR. Uh, it's almost five times your money when I include the cash flow and the price change. And I think for this, uh, this, is, this is a really strong case where a company has been beaten down. Uh, it has lots of free cash flow and the upside isn't too unrealistic. And with a little bit of assumptions or some mild growth over the long term, you get a really nice play. 
Uh, and I, I, I like that. So let's review our five key attributes and see what we get. Top line revenue growth, uh, not historically. EBITDA growth, not historically. Strong free cash flow, absolutely. Low debt, no, but I'm gonna give it a pass. So I'll check the box right now on low debt because the red hat. And if they're able to grow, that four will come back down into the three range, which we want. And well priced, yes, I think it's cheap. It has been beat up. So for us, when we look at kind of risk reward, I think it has been beaten down. And if they are able to turn the business around, that's your risk here. Uh, even mildly, I think you can get a surprise to the upside like we're seeing at 26%. That's an annualized return. So that means every year over that decade, you would have earned 26% on your money if this pans out. If it, if it changes, if the stock price were to move up or down, what does it look like on a distribution? We're at $25 right now, 26% IRR. If it were to go up, if the price increased even at $166 a share, it's still a 20% IRR target uh, given these assumptions on cash flow and growth rate. If it declines to sub 100, which would be very difficult I, to see, but if, if it did, it'd be a 33% annualized IRR. We're gonna give this one a good, uh, I, th I think because we've outlined the metrics, you can see that the, the upside potential here, I think outweighs the downside. Uh, and so on a risk adjusted basis, I think it's definitely a good play. Let me know what you think. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. This is Rational Investing. We look at cash flow as, as, as how we value money. And, and this one is a strong case. Um, Please subscribe, comment, let me know what you also like to see, and I'm happy to review it. Uh, once again, Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.